my case is uh, Janaki. Uh, she's 72 year old, coming from Haripat. Her presenting complaint is history of fall and pain and inability to walk since one day. History of presenting complaint. She gives a history of fall by tripping over stairs and sustained pain and inability to walk. Pain was to the right hip. No history suggestive of loss of consciousness. No history suggestive of any other injury to the chest, abdomen. The patient was uh, immediately taken to the hospital and she was diagnosed to have fracture necrofema. Past history, she is a known hypertensive for past 10 years and she is on antihypertensive medication and uh, also she is on regular follow-up. She also gives history of uh, chest pain and uh, increased setting since two years and uh, she was diagnosed to have myocardial infarction and she was uh, admitted in ICU for almost 14 days. Uh, during her ICU stay, uh, there's history of costly injections being taken on the first day and also uh, some device to support uh, to in maintain her heart rate was uh, given to her for two weeks and then later on a surgery was underwent uh, for uh, giving uh, uh, increasing the heart rate uh, to normalize the heart rate uh, permanently. Now uh, she's discharged with a few medications. Following that, she doesn't give any history of chest pain, dyspnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, edema, syncope, etc. Now, no history of bronchial asthma, pulmonary tuberculosis, jaundice, thyroid disease, or no other systemic illness. Um, now, no, personal history, family history, socioeconomic status, nothing relevant. Her drug history, she is on TAB, met metoprolol, 50 milligram OD, TAB, glycerol trinitrate, 2.6 milligram OD, TAB, uh, clopidogrel, 75 milligram OD, TAB, aspirin, 75 milligram OD, TAB, atorvastatin, 10 milligram HS. And uh, her general examination, patient is conscious, cooperative, moderately built and nourished. No uh, pala, jaundice, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, pedal edema, sacral edema. She is on uh, skeletal traction for her right lower lip. JVP is not elevated. There's a scar in the left pectoral region just below the clavicle. Her pulse rate is 70 per minute, regular and fixed heart rate, normal in character, volume, no radio radial uh, delay or no radio femoral delay. All peripheral pulses were equally palpable. Her BP is 130 bar 80 millimeters of mercury on the right upper lip in line pull down position. And her respiratory rate is 14 per minute, thoraco abdominal. Temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Her airway examination uh, is uh, nothing relevant. Now, uh, in musculoskeletal system, except for the skeletal traction, no uh, relevant uh, significant history. Then in, in her center, uh, CVS examination, pulse rate, as I described earlier, it was 65 per minute fixed heart rate. And um, on uh, um, auscultation, uh, S1, first heart sound S1 and S2 was her normal with uh, varying intensity. No S3, no murmur. In central nervous system, higher mental functions were normal. Uh, except for the right lower limb motor uh, system examination, otherwise normal. In gastrointestinal system, respiratory system were uh, also normal. In summary, 72-year-old uh, postmenopausal female patient with history of hypertension, old uh, myocardial infarction, and uh, history of uh, pacemaker implantation for complete heart block from her uh, uh, previous discharge card. Now presently admitted for fracture neck or femur for fixation. She's on, on antiplatelet and antihypertensives. So what are your anesthetic concerns in this patient, Lakshmi? In this patient, uh, first of all, she's a postmenopausal uh, elderly patient. She's uh, hypertensive. She has a age? 70 years. Uh, she's hypertensive. She has, uh, gives a history of myocardial infarction. And uh, she uh, has a pacemaker in situ. And uh, also, uh, she is on antiplatelet drugs, antihypertensives, and now admitted for fracture neck of femur. So, you have a geriatric patient post MI with pacemaker and antiplatelet therapy coming for fracture neck of femur. So, what are the physiological changes that you expect uh, in the cardiovascular system in this patient? In the cardiovascular system, uh, first of all, uh, she is an elderly patient. Uh, so uh, her uh, vascular, uh, vessel wall thickening will be there. Uh, there will be impil, uh, hyperplasia, then um, collagenization of the media, and also uh, her systo systolic blood pressure tends to be uh, high, and diastolic blood pressure normally remains almost constant in elderly. Her uh, stroke, uh, cardiac output will be reduced. Uh, uh, her ability to cope up with stress by increasing the heart rate and stroke volume will be less. 
there will be reduced response to baroreceptor reflexes and uh, also along this along with this this patient is having a history of myocardial, myocardial infarction, infarction. Uh, so um, problems in myocardial infarction on the left when we can what is the incidence of reinfarction rate in patients with history of myocardial infarction perioperative incidence of uh, reinfarction perioperative uh, mi uh, for patients who have got mi less than 3 months uh, of history uh, they will be having a 37% increased risk of having perioperative MI. For three to six months, it's almost 15%, and more than uh, six months, it's 5%. So, so what are the risk factors that precipitated MI in this patient? In so this can patient, you say the risk factors for myocardial infarction? In, in this patient, she is a postmenopausal <coughs> patient, elderly, and also she has a history of hypertension, uh, on which, uh, for which so she is on medication. postmenopausal age Post group. History of hypertension. In this patient, otherwise, old age, then uh, smoking is a history, hypercholesterolemia. Then Can you say chances. the clinical predictors of uh, uh, cardiac risk according to ACCHA uh, guidelines? The clinical uh, cardiac predictors. There are major, intermediate, and minor predictors uh, for cardiac risk. Major risk includes uh, um, significant arrhythmias, uh, significant uh, valvular heart disease, decompensated cardiac failure and also an acute or recent MI. Then uh, intermediate predictors includes renal disease, diabetes mellitus, uh, compensated uh, heart failure, and uh, uh, minor predictors includes uh, uh, SDTG in this advanced stage, then uh, controlled hi uncontrolled hypertension, history of stroke. This orthopedic surgery comes under which uh, clinical uh, surgical predictor? Uh, in the, as a surgical risk, I surgical said risk that, uh, intermediate risk group. What are the respiratory system changes uh, seen in geriatric patients? Respiratory system, uh, their uh, protective reflexes are lost, nasociliary clearance will be less, and also they will have. Uh, Why there is increased patient? incidence of hypoxemia in elderly patients? Hypoxemia. What are the causes? Uh, there's increased uh, dead space in elderly patient. Also, ventilation perfusion mismatch has occurs. Can you say uh, changes in the lung volumes and capacities? Uh, residual volume increases. Uh, functional residual capacity also increases. Total lung capacity decreases. Vital capacity decreases. Closing cap volume and closing capacity also increases. What is the relation between this closing capacity and FRC when it comes to these elderly people? Like uh, closing capacity uh, comes mo over of FRC, so there is increased chance of airway collapse. So what is the significance? So what is the significance of this? Increased chance of airway collapse at end expiration. So they are more prone. The before FRC, the airway tends to collapse. Mm -hmm. So there is increased chance. Increased chance of desaturation and hypertension. What are the patient-related factors for development of postoperative pulmonary uh, dysfunction? Postoperative respiratory dysfunction. Uh, Can you say some of the factors? Like postoperative uh, pulmonary patients who have history of uh, previous uh, pulmonary diseases, COPD, then who patient is having a history of smoking, all those can contribute to postoperative pulmonary dysfunction. Uh, atelectasis, history of atelectasis. So coming to the nervous system, what are the changes in uh, nervous system in geriatric patients? Nervous system, uh, the brain volume is reduced, uh, then cerebral uh, blood flow and cerebral metabolic rate reduces, but cerebral autoregulation remains almost normal. Then uh, there is decreased the sleep, there will be cognitive impairment, and also uh, there can be diseases associated with diseases like uh, Parkinsonism. So any Chinese problem disease. in taking consent in this patient? Yeah, obviously. Uh, my patient is conscious and worried, so I didn't have any difficulty in taking consent. But uh, in elderly patient, generally, they and they might have cognitive impairments, so there will be difficulty in obtaining consent. Uh, what about the change in the dose of local anesthetics? Uh, local elderly anesthetics, patients? Uh, elderly patients are uh, sensitive to local anesthetics, and hence the dose has to be reduced. And also, no, why, what, what is the reason for the dose, re reduced dose requirement in these elderly patients? What is the anatomical changes which occur? Like uh, for regional anesthesia, the size of the uh, Epidural space is reduced, the spinal so space that is reduced. S reduction in the size of intervertebral space yes. is important for spinal or for epidural? For epidural. Then there is also volume of CSF is also reduced. Then the 
intervertebral uh, for a distance uh, in between the intervertebral foramina is also narrowed so that what happens to the myelin sheath myelin sheath uh, reduce uh, there will be decreased myelination so uh, also the sensitivity is also increased number of axons only. the number so of neurons number of axons mm. reduced number of neurons so, neuron neuron so they have an increased sensitivity to, to the to local, local anesthetics mm. and also when we inject the drug in the epidural because of the clearance less because of the reduced space of the intervertebral disc the escape of the drug through the transforaminal space is less mm -hmm. so thereby the uh, the drug Volume tends increase. to ascend up so that is why we get an increased response to this local anesthetic mm -hmm. so basically when we do geriatric patients we tend we should remember to give a lower Dose. volume of local anesthetic in the subarachnoid uh, block because that we will end up getting the same uh, response which we would get and if you give a larger volume definitely the hemodynamic stability is going to be hampered what are the different indication for pacemaker insertion and what can be the indication for pacemaker in this patient in this patient from her discharge child what uh, are the usual uh, indications first usual indications are yeah. symptomatic uh, defects in the impulse conduction that is av nodal disease symptomatic uh, defects in the impulse production like sinus nodal disease then uh, long qt syndrome then uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy dilated cardiomyopathy hypertrophic i mean hypersensitivity carotid sinus syndrome and then uh, what, what about in this patient what can be the cause of pacemaker insertion in this patient uh, she was put for pacemaker for complete heart block uh, following inferior volume mile from her discharge card okay. from her ecg changes and from her mm -hmm. card we could identify that we could identify inferior vol uh, kidney history of inferior, inferior volume mile and uh, why inferior volume mile patients uh, are more prone to develop complete heart block like inferior volume mile patients uh, it's basically because of rca territory involvement rca is the one supplying sinus node and av node so it's uh, defect can be what about the vagal tone in these patients in the rca tone will be high in elderly patient also in rca infarction vagal tone will be high you told that they are uh, they have a in the cardiovascular system they have a decreased baroreceptor reflex mm -hmm. so what is the significance of that Um, this patient uh, and even genetic patients so they cannot tolerate hypotension so they won't be having reflex tachycardia uh, following hypotension if they when uh, going so to hypotension so heart rate is not a indicator indicator for yeah. hypotension or hypovolemia and in your history you told that the patient has come with history of fall so in that history what what important points will you ask regarding this history of fall i had asked her uh, whether she had fall following any syncope or uh, loss of consciousness so what is the most important cause for this uh, giddiness in this age group because of the baro receptor uh, one cause can be because of already she is a cardiac patient Cardi so some irregularity in her rhythm itself uh, could have caused pacemaker but pacemaker wouldn't have no um, other than that mm. most mm. commonly in geriatric patients you have orthostatic hypo no no you have the <coughs> decrease cerebral circulation yeah. so carotid so circulation will be <coughs> reduced in this patient so that is why they will have so you need mm. to do make sure that what investigation we can do Carotid to stop yes so this is one of the most common cause for at this age See. for patients to have giddiness and fall down mm -hmm. now as an anesthetist uh, in history taking how will you assess the activities of daily living on will you how will you assess that her reserve is good in this patient like first i will ask uh, what all what all activities she can do whether she can carry out her normal daily activities uh, uh, by assessing that nyh grading can be done if this uh, this patient uh, since she can do almost all her routine activities she comes on nyh grade 2 she cannot exert much then 
also uh, functional status can be assessed by uh, metabolic equivalence then one method which as anesthetist yes. we can also see is the x-ray of the patient the fracture site so from that fracture site when the patient comes to us either it's an intertrochanteric fracture or a neck of femur fracture uh, for an intertrochanter to break definitely the force has to be high so we come to a conclusion that the activity of daily living if his routine the power is good his movements are good and they are uh, healthy a fall sustained by such type of patients will have a intertrochanteric fracture whereas a neck of femur fracture is needs only a trivial fall mm -hmm. so those patients will have very poor reserve so that is why we consider neck of femur fractures the mortality and morbidity is higher than intertrochanteric fractures. Mm -hmm. So this is one method because it's very difficult to uh, assess the reserve for these patients. So this is one method which we follow where we look at the fracture and if it's an intertrochanter, it's little bit we are, much, we feel it's much better for the patient than a neck of femur. How do we assess whether the patient is uh, dependent on pacemaker? Uh, can we assess from the history, from physical examination, also from her ECG? Like from history, uh, like whether she has a history of syncope following which she was not put on a uh, pacemaker. Then if it is improved, then uh, she is a pacemaker is functional and dependent. Then from physical examination, from when we check the pulse rate, pulse rate will be fixed. Uh, for uh, pacemaker dependent patients and also there will be varying intensities of the uh, S heart sounds mm -hmm. S1 and S2 and also from ECG we can see the pacemaker spikes uh, following uh, if it is atrial pacing there will be a spike before the P wave and if it is ventricular pacing there will be a spike before uh, QRS complex and the QRS complex following the spike will be broadened and we can get a cardiology opinion also assessing the dependence. So when do you going to uh, plan surgery for this patient? In this patient, uh, since she has multiple uh, medical comorbidities, I would like to optimize her uh, physical status first and then take up uh, in the case. For that, what investigations will you do for this patient? In this patient, uh, I'll do a baseline uh, hematological investigations and hemoglobin uh, for us uh, knowing whether anemia is there. Uh, then I'll do a platelet count, a bl a ble a bleeding time and floating time to assess her coagulation uh, and parameters. Then uh, serum electrolytes since she's an bleeding time and floating time. Then serum electrolytes uh, since she is an elderly, she might have uh, electrolyte imbalances. Then uh, I'll do uh, an ECG. Then r uh, random blood sugar will be uh, checked. Then I'll do a, a ECG to assess her rate, rhythm, uh, her uh, whether she uh, means patient spikes are there and also uh, for other I mean since she is an MI patient she will, will be having Q waves and also for LV strain pattern for I'll go for a chest x-ray to assess her lung shadows because uh, elderly are uh, prone for having <coughs> infections and also uh, to assess the cardiac shadow from there and also pacemaker via the syndrome. chest x-ray can you other than the lung shadows, what else can you see? Because this patient is on a pacemaker. Pacemaker uh, generator and the uh, leads can be seen. And the continuity of the leads can be followed. Also, we can identify the type, uh, manufacture of the pacemaker from a coat. Uh, many uh, pacemakers have a coat that can be obtained from the chest x-ray. Will you ask for proteins? Yeah, because serum albumin will be reduced in elderly patients. And that can affect uh, drug metabolism. So I'll ask for So what is the significance of protein albumin levels are decreased? What happens to the requirement like of drugs? Free fraction of the drugs uh, will be increased. Uh, of, uh, acid, acid, uh, acidic drugs will be increased. Uh, like, for example, thiopentone, benzodiazepam, uh, all those are albumin bound, so the friction. So they have fraction increased sensitivity to sensitivity those Sensitivity of those drugs. Any other investigation you'll ask? Um, I'll get a cardiology consultation for uh, echo to assess her uh, ventricular functions and also a cardiology evaluation for pacemaker functioning. And uh, what about grouping and cross Blood grouping. I'll do a blood group and cross and then I'll arrange blood for the patient.
Will you ask for a CT brain? CT brain. See, this is an old lady who's 72, and mm -hmm. she has come to you with history of fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time, when old people fall down, they are either going to the bathroom or they are just out of the bathroom, and nobody nobody is there to witness the fall. And you also told me that these patients are on antiplatelets. Mm -hmm. So even a trivial fall and a small injury to the head can cause an intracerebral bleed, which later may become a problem postoperatively. So for completion, definitely it's better to ask for a CT brief because he's on antiplatelets. If she's not on antiplatelets, it <coughs> may not be needed. Now, what will you do to pre-optimize this patient? You said, okay, now you receive this patient. What are, what all the thing? now do you plan for surgery immediately or what are you planning to do? I would like to optimize her before surgery. Why? If I get, because she is an elderly patient with hypertension, with old myocardial infarction, uh, and also uh, she's on pacemaker and on antiplatelet therapy. So first I would like to get a cardiology opinion about stopping the platelet uh, for uh, tap clopilet for seven days prior to surgery and aspirin five days before surgery. And then um, I'll no, find... Aspirin, <coughs> there is no indication to stop aspirin. In current recommendations, aspirin, irrespective of the dose and timing, can be continued intraoperatively. So only the only drug, the only antiplatelet which can be continued without stopping is aspirin. Clopilet, yes, you need to stop five days before surgery. So what all will you do to pre-optimize this patient? Uh, first, I'll control her, uh, means I'll check whether her hypertension is controlled, uh, means with cardiology opinion, uh, functional st uh, status of the heart will be known. Then also pacemaker functionality will be checked uh, with, uh, with help of cardiologist. And uh, also I'll uh, ask them to stop clopilet seven days prior to surgery. And uh, then... Uh, You'll continue aspirin. I'll, yeah, I'll continue aspirin. And then uh, on the pre-op day... What's the plan of anesthesia? Plan of anesthesia, uh, I'll go for combined spine and epidural. Before that, will you, what all, what other things will you do for pre-optimization? What are all the complications you expect? You are going to keep this patient with a fracture, neck of femur, in bed for five days, which means she is not mobile, which she is 75 years. Now, what other factors do you need to look into and what all do you need to do to keep that five days advantages for the patient? First of all, I should take care of uh, her uh, pain uh, because uh, pain should be managed because elderly patients, when they uh, have pain, they might go in for uh, cognitive dysfunction. Uh, pain will be addressed and also uh, her, uh, means I'll check for any signs of DVT. So what will you do for pain? Pain, I'll give uh, tap paracetamol, uh, uh, fi uh, 650 milligram, uh, uh, four times daily, then also uh, you can give as much as 750 to 1 gram. IV you can give and uh, up to 3 to 4 grams per day. Uh, a very well-nourished geriatric patient, you can go to 4 grams, but otherwise you can stop with 3 grams IV per day. Yeah, I'll stop. Uh, I, won't, I won't give NSAIDs. I mean, NSAID, so I'll go for uh, femoral block if possible uh, for the patient uh, to uh, get uh, analgesia. And uh, if uh, more proper uh, definitely you can give femoral block then because nowadays the concept of on arrival block is there. So femoral block is technically very easy to give in patients who come, and uh, it takes care about 60 to 65 percent of the pain relief. Is uh, patient gets pain relief with that block. Then what about the hydration status of this patient? Um, I'll ask her to take oral fluids, uh, plenty of oral fluids. I'll uh, ask her to maintain proper hydration. Also, uh, then... If she has a good, if echo gives you a good LV function, I think you should start this patient on IV fluids. Because you should remember that whenever there is a fracture, either in the neck of femur, shaft femur, any fracture, there is intramedullary blood loss which is concealed. 
which we are not able to see. So definitely there will be around 750 to 1 liter of blood loss when there is a fracture neck of femur. So we need to hydrate these patients well. So definitely you can start on IV fluids. And what else will you do? Uh, oxygen supplementation can be given uh, because yes. uh, BO elderly patient are prone for uh, hypoxemia. <coughs> then uh, DVT prophylaxis in the form of uh, uh, stockings is given. Even uh, low molecular weight heparin can be started by in super KB sub few dose. Uh, of are OD. you planning to start low molecular weight heparin? Which you shouldn't say it can be started. In this patient, are you planning to start? No, if I'm taking her up for surgery, I'm not planning to uh, start. You're planning postoperatively? No, no when you post. See, you said you'll stop clopilet mm. and aspirin you'll continue. Mm. So, what is the indication for you to. No, sorry, I won't start heparin full stage then. See, very one thing you should be clear is if the patient has tendency to develop some sort of thromboembolism risk is there mm -hmm. or any risk of cardiac event, then you can do this bridging with low molecular weight heparin mm -hmm. and stop one day before surgery. But if there is no indication and you don't anticipate any coronary event, then I think you don't have to start low molecular weight heparin. Mm -hmm. It depends on as to the reason as to why initially the antiplatelets were started. Mm -hmm. For this patient, what are you going to do? She'll be giving is she a stable patient? Uh, um, is she uh, stable? Yes, she is a stable patient. So I won't be starting low molecular weight heparin. Then, then what, what else? Will you catheterize this patient? Yeah, urine output should be um, Definitely, you need to catheterize these patients because you at this age, we need to know the intake output chart. Yes. Definitely, we have to Can look into the output. Uh, I'll try to keep the output more than 0.5 ml per kg per uh, hour. Uh, adequate hydration will be given. So, so what pre-medication you will give? Pre-medication uh, on the day before surgery. And, and also uh, to add, you need to give a head up nursing and chest physio, mm -hmm. incentive spirometry. Mm -hmm. You should take measures to prevent preoperative mm -hmm. atelectasis. Mm -hmm. So that, because for the next five days, she's going to be in bed. Pre-operative medication, uh, I'll give uh, tab alprexolone 0.25 milligram on uh, day before surgery. I'll give tab on uh, 4 milligram uh, uh, on the day before surgery <coughs> at night and ta tab omeprazole 20 milligram uh, on the day before uh, surgery. Uh, I'll continue tab metoprolol. <coughs> then I'll uh, continue atorvastatin and uh, uh, glycerol trinitride and uh, I will... Uh, yeah, on the day of surgery morning also, I'll ask the patient to uh, take tab alprexol on 0.25 at 6 a.m., tab on citron uh, 4 milligram and tab omeprazole. Yeah. What and happens to our antihypertensives? You will continue she or not? Is, uh, having tab metal of 50 milligram 1 OD, I'll continue that. Metoprolol. Yes. I'll continue that. Yeah. Then, then uh, I'll ask for uh, morning in serum electrolyte, then... Uh, Then I'll uh, proceed with the. Uh, what is your plan? Of <coughs> what is your plan? I'm planning for a combined spine and uh, epidural anesthesia. Uh, first, uh, before taking the patient Pointers. into the uh, so, uh, operation what is theater, the patient's hemoglobin level? Hemoglobin is uh, 10 milli uh, 10 gram percentage. So, do you want to transfuse and cross match and keep blood ready? No, I al uh, already uh, kept uh, blood arranged and uh, 10 gram percentage. You don't need to transfuse at. Uh, 10 gram percentage. Pre-operative. Pre-operative, I don't need to transfuse. So what will there be your transfusion trigger for uh, to start transfusion? 10 gram percentage. Okay. Because she is having history of myocardial infarction, elderly patient, and uh, on pacemaker. Uh, then uh, before taking the patient into the um, op operation theater, I'll check the table, I'll check the machine, I'll check uh, whether warmer is available, fluid warmer is available. Then I'll check the emergency drug tray, uh, all general anesthetic drugs, and uh, check the airway cart. And uh, also I'll arrange for an external uh, defibrillator and with pacing pads available. Once uh, theater is uh, set, I'll take the patient inside. What else will you keep ready? She's a patient on pacemaker. I'll see whether ad, uh, emergency drug tray is ready. 
then the ties of Vimali. There's uh, something uh, called magnet. Magnet. There's something called magnet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What are you going to do? Madam, for this patient, uh, since she is having a surgery of neck of femur, there isn't any need for uh, uh, means ma changing the mode to asynchronous mode. Uh, I'll inform the cardiologist on the day but of you surgery. But you always also need to keep it ready because mm -hmm. you should remember regional anesthesia mm -hmm. is a blind technique and at any time if it fails, what happens? Mm -hmm. So plan A fails, you need to do plan B. So you still should keep everything ready. Always the dictum is... Even if you are going to give regional anesthesia, okay. you should keep everything ready for general anesthesia. Uh, general anesthetic drugs will be loaded and uh, also when everything uh, table is ready, I'll uh, make, uh, take the patient inside. What and else will you make sure is most important ready for this patient who is uh, on pacemaker? External defibrillator. No, that is an anesthetist. Mm -hmm. From surgical point of view, a cautery, I'll ask for a bipolar means I'll uh, discuss with the surgeons to cooperate by using a bipolar cautery and uh, cautery plate should be uh, as far as You should not patient. discuss. Surgeons won't know anything. You should tell. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, anesthetists are the ones who are doing it. And you should make sure or tell your theater technician, please keep bipolar. And then the other thing is, you should make sure the machine is in what mode? Cutting or coagulation is better? Uh, coagulation mode. Cutting, cutting is cutting better. Mode. Yes. Coagula if I, yes. You say coagulation and I nod, you will have to say cutting. No, it is cutting. Cutting, cutting is better than coagulation. Yeah. This you need to always remember to counter check on that. And um, I'll bring the patient in. And also what will you do with the diatomy pad? Diatomy pad will be placed as far from the pacemaker. And since it's the lower limb surgery, it can be placed on the uh, lower limb and, uh, and the opposite, opposite limb, limb and more distally from Distant the, to the pacemaker generator. Yeah. Next. And then I'll bring in the patient to the operation theater. I'll attach monitors like uh, ECG, uh, then a pulse oximeter, then uh, a non-invasive blood pressure monitor. Uh, then I'll secure an, uh, an IV lens. Another thing which is very important to remember when you get your theater ready, you never told you will get Warm blankets. Warm or ready? Uh, you told. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Then warm fluid warmer and also uh, surface warmer will be made ready. Then uh, once the patient is in, I'll secure IV line under local anesthesia. Two 18 gauge cannula will be secured, and also I'll uh, get an intra-arterial line put under local anesthesia. And after uh, pre-medicating the patient with injection midazolam 0.5 milligram and injection fentanyl, almost 20 microgram. 20 microgram. And once intral arterial line is also secured, um, I'll give a femoral but block. Definitely, do you need an intra arterial line? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Because I expect, uh, I, uh, since this surgery of neck of femur also, uh, she's going for heavy arthroplasty. If bone cement is used, there are chances of hypotension, also pacemaker. Mm -hmm. So I can get the pulse uh, rhythm with the Fine. arterial line. Then uh, once she is in, I'll uh, give uh, femoral block uh, for uh, positioning. Before posi Where will you give the femoral block? On patient is lying supine. Inside the theater? Inside the theater. With femoral block, I'll uh, position her sitting. And uh, after femoral block, then under strict asepsis and under local anesthesia, I'll uh, first put epidural at uh, L3, L4 in the space with 18 gauge to he needle. And How much of volume will you give in spinal? Spinal, uh, I'll give uh, 1 ml of uh, injection bupivacaine 0.5 percentage heavy with uh, 25 microgram fentanyl added. So total of 1.5 ml. And then with epidural test dose of lignocaine 2 percent with injection adrenaline and 1 in 2 lakh. Then after uh, giving uh, spinal uh, and uh, anesthesia, I'll place the patient up to which level you want to block i'll block i like to get blocked till t10 sensory level t10 so this 1.5 into one yes. one uh, one ml bp vacant and 2.5 okay. ml fentanyl will do and i'll Only check for sensory remember level the two segment regression levels will be faster Fast. when you give a low volume so but since you have an epidural I that will help you to top up yes.
once uh, uh, but why do you want to do the femoral block inside the theater for analgesia for positioning the patient Sitting. positioning for spinal mm. can it be given in the pre operative room if your pre operative room is well adequate for resuscitation yes yes, yes. Mm. we bring the patient this, uh, the actually we can do it in the pre operative room because it saves time also uh, and also you should remember a femoral block given and then made to sit is of no use because you need to at least give half an hour to 40 minutes for the drug to start acting so that much time is required at least half an hour once you put the block and then you make the patient sit he is not going to have any pain relief so you need to have <coughs> adequate time between the block and your uh, positioning for patient once uh, the patient, I make the patient sit by, I'll check for the sensory level once, uh, then I'll adjust the table Interoperatively, if this patient develops hypotension, how, how they are going to manage? First, I'll uh, give, if I, I would have loaded ephedrine, uh, six milligram per ml uh, dose, I'll give Did six milligram per cost? ml. Uh, so I'll search for the cause, uh, then I'll give, uh, I'll check whether uh, there is excessive bleeding. Then I'll see for any other causes of hypotension. Then uh, I'll give ephedrine. Has the surgery me. started? You uh, gave spinal and then you s you're uh, saying uh, I'll check for excessive bleeding. They are in the 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 Okay. Yeah. Means it can be due to spinal uh, anesthesia. Hypotension can be due to spinal anesthesia, initial fall. So I'll supplement ephedrine 6 milligram and see. If she is not picking up with that, I will give injection uh, phenylephrine 10 milligram boluses. Which will be better? Phenylephrine. Why? Yes, uh, it is uh, alpha receptor blocker. Uh, what does ephedrine do ephedrine to the cardiac? Also beta, uh, increase the heart rate. Chronotropic effect is also there. Mm -hmm. Beta 1 action. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, since she is pacemaker dependent, uh, she is not going to use. So you want me to decide whether to use? So what are you going to use? First, I'll try with ephedrine and then phenylephrine. You're going to use ephedrine or phenylephrine? Phenylephrine. No, there is no harm. There is no harm in using one or two incremental doses of ephedrine. It's not going to do great harm to the patient. Okay, you're not going to give 30 milligrams of ephedrine then. You are only going to give, and most of the time in these type of patients, what we do is we give three milligrams of ephedrine. So we give incremental doses as three, three, instead of giving six, six. Mm -hmm. So I think one or two doses will not harm this patient. So you can use ephedrine, no problem. Next. Um, mm, once the surgery started, I'll uh, continue monitoring uh, her urine output. Yeah. I'll uh, try to keep uh, it more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Then I'll monitor uh, her ECG. Uh, pulse, I'll uh, strictly uh, keep the hands on the pulse so that I can know the beat to beat uh, variability and uh, also uh, the uh, uh, arterial waveform will be checked and also um, temperature also uh, uh, will be checked by nasopharyngeal probe. They need a rise intraoperatively for deep, re deep relation. Uh, so how we are going to do? In this case, uh, since she has got a pacemaker, uh, in the left pectoral area, I'll, uh, um, I, if needed for cardioversion uh, uh, defibrillation, I'll use my pads in the apex posterior, and I'll use lower energies for cardioversion. Lower energy in the sense? 120 joules starting. Mm. What about, uh, so you keep the patient warm? And How will uh, you monitor? Do you, will you follow any monitoring technique for hypothermia? Nasopharyngeal probe. Patient is already on aspirin on antiplatelets. Yes, you can pass an aid rheumatic. Nasopharyngeal probe. Otherwise, I think uh, this is since, uh, since orthopedic procedure and it's only an interdrochanteric fracture, you keep a warm air blanket, keep warm fluids, give warm blood. I think that should be sufficient to maintain the temperature of this patient. It's not a very major procedure where you really need to monitor the temperature. You just have to make sure patient is warm.
then uh, in drop uh, uh, means if there is any requirement for in drop if there is any uh, requirement for transfusion and transfuse then also so trigger transfusion would be uh, 10 gram already okay. patient is 10 so will you allow any blood loss no. for this patient no i'll transfuse uh, blood uh, in depending on the loss and also uh, i'll keep i'm again a warmer uh, warm fluids and uh, warm blood will be given then once the surgery is over okay then post operatively post operatively i post op what are you going to do post op i'll uh, shift her to a high dependency unit or icu where I'll again monitor for uh, her oxygen issue. I'll supplement her with oxygen. I'll supplement her with adequate analgesia. You continue your monitoring? Yeah, continue, I'll continue my monitoring. I'll supplement adequate analgesia with, uh, uh, I mean, since I have an epidural catheter in situ, I'll uh, use injection ropivacaine 0.2 percentage with injection fentanyl 2 microgram per ml, uh, 4 ml per hour infusion. Continue, continue. If at all she gets any intermittent, means uh, breakthrough pain, I'll supplement bolus doses. What are the other modalities of pain? Breakthrough pain, what will you supplement? Uh, additional 3 ml, depending upon the sensory level, I supplement additional 3 ml of uh, ropivacaine, same drug mixture. Post-operatively also you can give a femoral block. Femoral block, block can be given. And, uh, and I told you femoral block only covers 60% of the pain relief. To make it really complete for a hip fracture, what other block has to be given? Obturator nerve block and uh, rat Anterior division or posterior division? Mm -hmm. Anti anterior Technically, division. obturator nerve anterior block is a little difficult, but you need to block the anterior, anterior division. Of the division. Mm -hmm. In an ultrasound, how will you look? How will you give the block? Femoral block uh, with ultrasound, I'll... Uh, no, uh, the anterior division of obturator. How will you look for it? Between which muscles do will, will you... Which muscles will you look for in the thigh? Psoas maybe. You can look for the anterior division between the adductor, longus and brevis. You will see a thin fascia between these two muscles will be the anterior division. And between the brevis and the magnus, you will see another thin fascia and there lies the posterior division. Technically, it is little difficult. So that is why, but you can do it. But most of the time, femoral block alone will take care, which is very easy and everybody can do it. What other drug will you concentrate on? I mean, what other post-operative drug can you give for these patients, which is very important? I mean, systemic? Not for analgesia. You should remember to put Low these patients on. Uh, DVT profile access will be given for this patient. And then Will you start clopidogrel? If the chamber sends to a finger, trigger an inhibitory node can be. Oh, that is the concept there. Yeah? <coughs> Hypotension as well as the failure to failure. signal. That is in a coordinate synchronization of the both atria and ventricles. How can you change it? This is more prone in patients with the either single chamber pacing. So always better. Even even with the dual chamber also it can occur, but. We can go for a dual chamber pacing. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi, you've been going at a very steady and good pace. Of course, unlike you, your the patient's pacemaker fails in drop. How will you uh, identify that and how will you manage that? No, I'll ask for a cardiology and I yes, already informed the cardiologist. No, in drop, it is, uh, it's failed. How would you suspect have a, it's uh, failed? Yeah, how will you first suspect that it's not working? Uh, uh, the pulse rate there will be, if I means I have a fixed pulse rate now, uh, that will be decreasing and hypotension will be there. And also ECG changes spikes. will be there, pacing spikes won't be seen. I, I have already, I mean, I forgot to tell you. Suppose the battery is failed, you, uh, it was an emergency, you didn't, uh, it was missed. Okay. I'll arrange, I have no, a pacemaker. No, how will you manage now? What will you do? Uh, I've arranged for an external uh, defibrillator with the pacing pads ready. Because the patient ha is not pacemaker dependent, they have a good rate and rhythm. And the patient is stable. The pacemaker has failed, but the patient is stable. They, he was not, she was not pacemaker dependent. Then we so can I'll wait and watch. No, I wait and watch. And I'll if the patient is unstable, then what do you Temporary do? pacing has to be given. Uh, until you get that ready, you can. Mm -hmm. 
Few things I would like to comment on this. One is, I don't know, I don't do much of, I do some ortho, but uh, are the surgeons ready to wait for seven days? Nowadays, the option is to do it as early as possible because the complications rates rise uh, in a very high way as the number of days increase. The, so we have to take these patients as early as possible. Second thing is about clopidogrel. Now, clopidogrel adds very little additional benefit over aspirin, like you said. But we have to understand is that 40% of the people who get clopidogrel, it doesn't act in them because it's a pro-drug and it doesn't have the enzymes to convert it into active drug. The second thing about clopidogrel is that the half-life is only six hours. So if you give a dose of clopidogrel, it's action that platelets all in the body, all the platelets in the body is inactivated. If your patient bleeds after that, you can actually give out platelets and the patients will be, that those platelets will act in these patients. The second question I want to raise is about low molecular, I don't know what was the answer, I didn't hear it properly, whether you will give low molecular weight heparin or not. You have to give low molecular weight heparin for a simple reason, because these patients can easily develop DVT. So DVT, I mean, DVT prophylaxis is a must in these patients. The third thing is about uh, your pacemakers. Now, most of the patients who are on pacemakers, they keep a backup rate. The pacemaker is at 50 or 60, and the patient is beating at, let's say, 70 or 80. So before surgery, what you do is you pro reprogram the pacemaker and make it 90 or 100, which is required when you have undergo anesthesia, you need a higher cardiac output. So you reprogram with 90 or 100 and then start your anesthesia. And then if your battery fails, you can easily make out because what will happen, patient will go back to his own yeah. rate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Actually, clinically, we do not wait, sir. But because this is a postgraduate symposium and uh, when patient is on clopilet, all evidence and all clinical evidence says that Clopidogrel has to be stopped five days prior to surgery or before the neuraxial blockade. So in that case, you don't want to stop, then textbook says you'll, the neuraxial blockade is a question mark. But pr clinically, we do not wait. We do it the next day. But since it's supposed under spine. Not an epidural. Not an epidural. Yes, under spinal, we do it and then give a femoral block postoperatively. But since this is a postgraduate symposium, we just wanted to take it how the textbook tells. Okay. I would like to thank Dr. Lakshmi Ramachandran, Dr. Veena N, and Dr. Maheshwari S. Kumar for the case discussion.